All right. I'm fired up to be in the house of the Lord today. How about you? All right. Seven of you are awake. Dad, I'm fired up. Let's go. Chase and Hannah, good luck. We got a bunch of them coming to you today. I'll try not to go too long. Technically, it's only 1020, so I can preach for a long time. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Oh, man. Whew. So, for those of you that like this, something is back today that we haven't had in a while. But uh, the sermon notes are back on the website. It's just a hair different than it was. Um, so if you'll go to fpcdan.com slash sermons, and today's sermon will be there. And when you go to that, if you click view media, there's a spot there to take the sermon notes. It basically has my slides on there, and then you can take notes on top of that and email it to you. I'm getting a little feedback, Todd, just a hair. Never fails. Devil's in the sound system. Um, and so if you want to do that, you can and, uh, email it to yourself and when you're done. and Pretty simple way to keep up with things. It helps some of you, and it hinders some of you. Yay. Um, so those of you that it helps, use it. And those of you that it don't, don't. Uh, a couple things I want to remind you of before we get into the sermon today. Tonight, we do have our deacon affirmation service at 6 p.m. here, and we'll have a kind of a dessert social after that. So we're looking forward to that tonight. It'll be a great time of celebration um, for the deacons that this church has chosen to be added to the deacon body. We will affirm them and celebrate them and celebrate what God is doing through that tonight and then have Sundays and, and whatnot after that back here in the back, so we're looking forward to that tonight. And then I do want to start mentioning this to you. Uh, Easter weekend, we have a lot going on Easter weekend. So that's Saturday morning of Easter, so that's March 30th at 10 a.m. We'll have the helicopter Easter egg drop again uh, in partner with the city and, and other businesses across the street over here at the football field. Um, we have, I think, five to six times the amount of eggs this year as we did last year. So hopefully every kid will get at least one. Um, we had a lot of people there last year. If you, if you weren't part of that, it was pretty amazing. Um, so we'll do that. And then immediately following that, we will have a spaghetti lunch, $5 a plate here to raise money for Mission Mexico. And we're just going to have that for anybody that wants to come. Um, you don't have to go to the egg drop to come to that. And we'll have that during the lunchtime after the egg drop is over until 1 o'clock or so. And, and that money will go towards the construction costs of Mission Mexico. Um, we'll go down there. Right now, we're going to build two houses. If a couple more people sign up, we'll end up building three houses, which means we'll need more money. Um, so we're going to raise money for that that way that day. And we'll also have a dessert auction that day. So all of you people that make beautiful desserts, um, you know who you are. One of these people going on this trip is probably going to be coming to you soon, asking you to make a dessert on their behalf. Um, and, and that will go to the individuals that are going on the trip. So if they go out and get two people to make a dessert and whatever money they raise for that, that goes to that individual. So if you want to help out your niece or nephew or granddaughter or grandson or your pastor, I'm just kidding. Don't help me. Um, that's, that will happen all that day. That's just Saturday. Then, of course, Sunday morning we'll have Easter service. Looking forward to that. Uh, the day that we, you know, we celebrate Jesus resurrecting every Sunday, but we really want to focus on it that day. Um, and then that night we will have our first night of prayer and worship. And it's something I spoke about a few weeks ago. I have never, and I try not to say that word very often, but I have never been more convinced of something that we're supposed to do than that night. Than, than getting serious about getting together as a congregation and praying together as a congregation. I cannot wait for that night. And I know it's a holiday weekend. And I know it's going to be slam-packed and we're going to be tired. And I know, I know all the things and I know some of you will not be able to be there and, and I understand. But I'm, I've never been more convinced of something in the ministry that this is something that we're supposed to be doing on a regular basis, praying together as a congregation, as a service, uh, along with some, some worship music during that time as well. So that will be that Sunday night that we will do that. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. 
All right. Anything else? No. Good. We're moving right along. So here's where we are. We're, we're going to spend a few weeks on this, this idea and this topic that Jesus stopped. Today we'll be in Mark 10, 46 through 52. And we're just going to spend an, some, some time on this, what it means, and with the question of, are you interruptible? Jesus stopped. Are you interruptible? That's what we want to look at these next few weeks. And I know I say it, and it's cliche for pastors to say it, but I'm telling you, Josh can vouch for me. I said this to him during the week preparing this sermon. Like, this is one of those sermons that I truly wish I was in a room by myself preaching into a mirror because I am terrible at this. Terrible at this. So I'm saying that on the front end so that you know that I'm right there with you, and that is true. So where we're getting into the, to the events of Jesus' life I want to tell you about that just a little bit before we get into these verses. We're coming into the timeline of Jesus' life here today at a pivotal time in his life. Jesus had just recently pulled the 12 aside and for the third time told them that his life was going to be ended soon. Uh, in, in verse 33 of this same chapter, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, spit, spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and he will rise after three days. But they didn't get it. It says that in the scriptures. It doesn't say they're dumb, but my translation would. But they didn't get it. Because it's hard to understand that someone is literally telling you that they have the ability to be sacrificed for all mankind's sins and also be resurrected. It's, it's kind of like, it just kind of flew over their heads, just like it would you and me. And so James and John, after that, because they really didn't get it, and they're, think about this now, Jesus' three closest dudes when he was living. Peter, James, and John. We, Peter denied him three times, right? Blew it prior to the resurrection. These two dudes, Jesus has just said this, right? And then these two guys come up to him and say, hey, we want to be the greatest. His three closest friends, they just don't get it. James and John, the sons of thunder, also called the sons of Zebedee, their father, uh, they just asked Jesus if they could sit at his right hand and his left hand. In other words, can we be really special, Jesus? Can we be really special? Can we have status? Can we have prestige? Can we have fame? Can we have glory alongside of you, Jesus, and, your, and in your kingdom that you're about to establish? I mean, that's what you're about to do, right? You're fixing to go establish your kingdom, right? That's what you're about to do, right, Jesus? This is where we get one of the most often quoted quotes of Je often quoted statements of Jesus in Mark 10. It says this, on the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is answering their statement, when they, their question when they ask that. Like, you dummies, that ain't what it's about. Again, my translation, which is... Loosely from the, from the Greek. Be a servant, he says. Be a servant. I'm going to pay a priceless price to buy your freedom from sin and death. A ransom. A price for redemption. A buying you back. I'm a suffering servant. You are to be also, Jesus tells them. And then... Before we get into our verses for today, understand where Jesus and the disciples and the crowd that is with him, understand where they're headed. Jesus' time in his life, his physical life, is running short, and he knows it. His days are down to just a couple of weeks or so. That's all that's left in his physical life. They are about 18 miles from Jerusalem, headed to Passover. When he gets there, that's when the triumphal entry is going to take place. The, the king's coronation, the public recognition of Jesus as Messiah by the crowds. That's what's about to happen in just a few short days. And then in a week, the cross and the grave and the resurrection three days later. In other words, Jesus has got some stuff on his mind where we're picking up today. He's got some really important work left to do in his earthly life coming up. He has his betrayal by the public and close friends coming soon. He has torture and beatings. He has the cross. 
in his near future. He has the wrath of God, the Father, for all mankind's sins coming soon. He has death coming soon. He has resurrected the glory coming soon, soon and very soon. Come on, Lord, soon and very soon. Do you have, do you have the urgency of the events and the timeline clear in your mind before we get into these verses today? Because if you don't have that, you're going to miss it. Do you have it? Can you see it? Can you feel the weight and the pressure of what is coming up soon for Jesus as he's on his way to Jerusalem? The racing mind that he must have had, the quickened heartbeat, the crowds pressing in all over on him, always wanting, always needing. Can you feel that? With that in mind, now we can get into our verses for today. Mark 10, starting in verse 46, says, They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd. Now, this story takes place in, in three gospels, the synoptic gospels. There's, there's three gospels that have a lot of things in common, and then John is like, I'm just going to write something completely different about all this other stuff. So it's kind of, it's very different. But the, the, the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all tell this story. They all tell it with a little bit different details. The, the, two, the two other gospels say there were two men in this story, but, but Mark only focuses on the one. And, and then some of the gospels say that they're entering Jericho. Some of them say that they're, this one says that he's leaving Jericho. And then that's where the skeptics get the young folks in college and say, look, there's a contradiction right there. How can you believe the word of God? You say there's no errors in the word of God. How can, how, can it, how can he be both leaving and entering Jericho? It's a simple answer for that. And this has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But I try to make these kind of points so the world can't confuse you. Here's how and why that's possible. There were two Jerichos. Did you know that? There's the old Jericho. You know, the walls come tumbling down and all that. And that city didn't really exist much more, but you still had to go through it. And then there was a new Jericho that Herod the Great during this time had rebuilt to this fancy city. So it's very simple that on this same time that this happened that Jesus was both leaving Jericho and entering Jericho. So I don't want to spend much more time there. But if you go into it with the mindset of God's word is infallible, if that's your mindset, then you can find what the real answer is. But if you're looking for contradictions, you're going to find contradictions that aren't actually contradictions. Moving along. There's this big crowd, right? There's this big crowd. All the, G, all of the uh, disciples, everybody's pressing in on Jesus, and they're on this trip. And then it says, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. Now, this guy's name, we say Bartimaeus or Bartimaeus is probably how you say it, actually. His name is Timaeus, okay? Bar is a prefix. It means son of. So it's kind of strange that it says Bartimaeus or Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. It's like, it's like saying the son of Timaeus, the son of Timaeus. That's what this is saying here. I don't know if it's because the bar is a Hebrew word and this is written in Greek, so they're making sure you understood, or if his, or if his name was Timaeus and he was also the son of Timaeus, it doesn't matter. But I just want to stop and think about this just for a little bit. How many people are named in the New Testament? You ever thought about that? I'm talking about like called out by name or at least by title. There's about 70, if you've never counted it up. About 70 people. That's including Jesus. That's including the 12 apostles. That's including, that's including Mary and Joseph and Paul. And there's Pilate. There's the woman at the well and the centurion. And there's Priscilla and Aquila. And there's Lydia and there's James, Jesus' brother, and there's Ananias and Sapphira. And when I say these names, things start popping up in your mind, right? Like these names are tagged to things. I think of Ananias and Sapphira, and I think, be honest with my money, because God ain't having it. When you, when you hear names, it brings events to mind, good and bad. My point is, there's just not a lot of people named in the New Testament. Considering all that was done, and all that Jesus did, and all the stuff that's talked about, there's not a lot of names. All the miracles, all the things that happened, all the storied events, the timeless, miraculous, godly activity, there's not a lot of names. So for someone to be mentioned at all, much less by name, it's a big deal. There, there must be a reason 
that the, he's mentioned by name. Now, spoiler alert and kind of an anticlimactic, we don't know why he was mentioned by name. Nobody. I mean, I've searched just about every commentary I could find. They're all like, we don't know. But Mark mentions in his gospel this blind beggar by name. The other two stories, it just talks about the blind beggars. It doesn't even say their name. Now, Mark was probably the earliest written gospel. So here's my theory, and be careful with your theories on Scripture. But here's my theory. I think at the time Mark was written, Bartimaeus, I'm going to say it like that for the rest of the sermon just to aggravate Dusty. Bartimaeus was probably well known. He was probably still alive. This is Mark saying, hey, you know that dude that, that, that says he was blind, but that he can actually see now? That's following Jesus, that became a follower of his? Well, here's his story. That's my, that's my thought. So when this letter was read of Mark, this gospel was read of Mark to the people of the church, they'd be like, oh, yeah, that's old, what's his name? Old son of Timaeus. Yeah, that's, that's my personal thing. But I'm, all my point is, it's kind of strange that he's named. This dude is a nobody, a nobody, a blind beggar sitting on a very well-traveled road because that's what people who are having to beg to survive do, right? That's why, they're, that's why they're on the same corners, the same stoplights in the same towns all the time. That's why Bartimaeus is here. It's a well-traveled road. It's almost Passover time. This dude ain't dumb. He's out there trying to see as many people as he can, so maybe a few people will throw him a few coins so he can survive. He's blind. He can't support himself. Not in this day and time. He was just a castaway, but he's named by name in Scripture because everybody that has faith in Jesus, every single person matters to Jesus, has their name eternally written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Even Bartimaeus, even you, even me. That's why I love that song. I can't believe you chose someone like me. Whew, that's good stuff. Moving along. Verse 47, when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out, son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. So this dude ain't dumb. He's fairly learned. I wonder if his dad, because it says he's son of Timaeus, I wonder if Timaeus was a somebody. That's my wonder. Was he a somebody that had taught his son at least to know some things? To know Jesus is the son of David, to know that term, to, to, that's to know scripture. This guy knows something. Son of David. First time this expression is used in the gospel of Mark is by a blind beggar. Most of the time in Mark, he's referred to as son of man. Bartimaeus was expressing faith in the one he knew could help him, the expected Messiah, and he begged for mercy. Next one, many people told him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, son of David. Have mercy on me, son of David. In, in comparison with the destiny of a nation, the fate of one blind beggar must have seemed unimportant, Mark Dowling says in his commentary. Remember what they're doing and where they're going. They think they're going to reestablish Israel as an independent nation. They ain't got time for no blind beggar on the side of the road hollering out stuff to Jesus. We ain't got time for that, bro. We've got important stuff to go do. Many people told him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more. I wonder... I wonder how often that happens in your life where God puts something, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and tells you to cry out something for him and to him. And you start to, and maybe you do a little bit, but then the world around you goes, shh, mm, keep control of yourself. We got important stuff to get to. We don't have time for that right now. Now the Holy Spirit of God is convicting you of this and you know you're supposed to be crying this out. Maybe right here. Maybe to a friend. Maybe to someone who used to be a friend. 
maybe to your boss, maybe to your spouse, maybe to your kids. I don't know what it is, but it happens all the time to us, doesn't it? We're supposed to speak up and say something and do something, but the crowd says, shh, shh, and you say, okay, I'll be quiet. They're probably right. I probably should just be quiet. Not Bartimaeus. Have mercy on me, son of David. Yeah. You think he was saying, have mercy on me? No. It's a crowd of people, hundreds of people. Jesus, over here. I need you. Shh. But Jesus stopped. <laughs> what a guy. I mean, think about it. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He knows he's fixing to be de facto crowned as king, which is going to put the bullseye square on him by the Sanhedrin, by Rome, by everyone. He knows all these people that are going to be saying, yeah, oh, King Jesus, yeah, are also going to flip and turn on him and ask for a nasty, rotten, mean thief to be released so that he can be, he knows all of this is about to happen. I mean, this is where I go, man, I'm not very good at this Jesus following thing because I'm more like the crowd than I am Jesus. I'm focused on the important work I got to do. I got things to do. I got, I got people to see. I got commentaries to read. I got scripture to read. I'll throw in some prayer in there every once in a while. I'll come see some of y'all every once in a while. I got important stuff to do, but I don't have time for things that are keeping me from getting to those important things, those important things in my mind. But Jesus stopped. The way the Greek is constructed here, it's like stopped in his tracks. Because remember, there's hundreds of people around him. And they're pressing on, and they're trying to get to Jerusalem. It ain't like they're just casually going along. They're trying to get somewhere. And then Jesus just throws on the brakes. Everybody's just pushing him along. Let's go, let's go. Shh, Bartimaeus, be quiet. They're trying to push Jesus along. And Jesus stops in his tracks is the way we might say it in English. It's not a casual stopping. It's a hold up. I got something to do. The kind of stopping that makes everybody that's following you stop and go, what is it? Jesus stopped and said, get him over here. Call him. Get that guy over here. I heard, I heard him. Maybe you couldn't even see him yet, but he heard him. Call, hey, get him over here. Call him. Get him over here. The followers of Jesus were not aware that more than a destiny of a nation awaited Jesus at Jerusalem. The destiny of the world hung in the balance. And yet Jesus paused and calls, calls the blind beggar to him. He's not going to save the physical nation of Israel. He's on his way to Jerusalem to save the world from all its sins so it can be reconciled, redeemed, brought back to God the Father through the Son. They just thought he was going to rescue Israel, the nation of Israel. It was bigger than that. And yet Jesus still has time to stop and say, get him over here. The Holman says, we often think in, ter of, in terms of sacrificing the one for the many. In the kingdom of God, however, even the one is sought out and blessed. Everybody matters in the kingdom of God. Every single person matters in the kingdom of God. Ain't nobody better than anybody because didn't any of us do to anything to get where we are? Forgiven, redeemed, children of God. You know what you did to do that? To be that, to become that? Nothing. Ain't no difference in Bartimaeus and the high priest of Israel in the eyes of God. Ain't no difference. The value is the same. Jesus stopped and he called him. So, so they called the blind man and said to him, hey, have courage, bro. Get up. He's calling for you. This is cool. Something's happening. Dude, get up. Once they knew Jesus was okay with stopping and doing ministry, 
and sharing the gospel, the gospel that Jesus heals and that Jesus saves, now they're excited. They're excited and they're motivated to get Bartimaeus to Jesus. There it is. I said it wrong, Dusty. There you go. Now that they realize he's not a nuisance or a pest, but someone who Jesus wants to see, they see him differently, which is the way we ought to see things. And we read this. I say we. I shouldn't say we because I shouldn't assume that you're like me. Hopefully you're better than I am. But we read this, I read this, and we go, silly disciples, silly disciples, how, how could they not know that Jesus had time for the blind beggar on the way to Jerusalem, the blind beggars, we know there's more than one. How, how can we, how do those silly disciples not know that Jesus has time for this guy, even though he's on his way to do the most important work any human has ever done in the history of ever? I mean, were these guys just slow or what? This is Jesus. Of course he has time to stop and see about this guy. I mean, we walk past him and those like him every single day without a moment's thought. But if we would have been there beside Jesus, we'd have got it. I mean, we're doing the exact same things right now in our life right now. But if I was standing beside Jesus back then, 2,000 years ago, I'd have been like, gosh, don't be quiet. Don't shush Bartimaeus. This is obviously something Jesus is going to do. No, that's not what would have happened. <laughs> you probably wouldn't have. I certainly wouldn't have. I'm not very good at doing it right now. You know how I know we wouldn't do it? Because we've been given clear instructions, clear instructions on what we're to be doing with our lives right now. We know exactly what Jesus' will is for our lives and who it is we're supposed to be executing that with right now. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you and remember I'm with you always to the end of the age. Send, go, preach, baptize, teach, and remember. 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 <laughs> now let's, let's take our list of activities and priorities from this past week, mental and physical. Mental priorities, lists, physical priorities and lists. Think about everything you did, everything you thought about, spent time on and energy on. How many times, think about it. Are you picturing last week? It was not a good week for me. I was a jerk most of the week, I'll be honest. Lauren didn't amen that, so thank God. How many times did you stop to bring a blind beggar to the healer and savior of the world during all that important stuff? Or were you just too busy getting to Jerusalem for what you wanted Jesus to do instead of the business that Jesus is actually about doing? Be quiet, Bartimaeus. Hush. Don't you know that Jesus is on his way to establish his kingdom? We're about to put the Sanhedrin in their place. Those bunch of suck-ups to Rome. They love to kiss up to Rome, and they love to punch down to us, their own kinsmen. We're about to go throw Rome out of Judea and Jerusalem. We're about to have our country back. We're about to be famous, James and John are thinking. We're about to go be somebodies. They'll be writing and singing songs about us for a thousand years. Bartimaeus, we ain't got time for you, dude. We got important stuff to go do. Important worldly things to go do. I got to get to practice. I got to go make more money. I've got to go do what it takes to please this guy or to please that gal. I've got some entertainment to get to. Or Bartimaeus, hey, I get it. It's hard out here for a blind beggar. But Bartimaeus, I got problems too, bro. 
You're not the only one with problems. I got problems. My life is hard too. I need healing too. I'm trying to get to Jesus so he can help me too. I'm sorry, Bartimaeus. I just don't, it's not that I'm too good for you. It's just that my problems are more important than yours. I need to get to Jesus so he can help me. I need Jesus to fix it all for me. Then, then, once Jesus fixes it all for me and everything is just right and prim and proper, then, Bartimaeus, we may swing back by and have a little time for you. That's how we act. We would never say it, but it's what we say with how we live our lives. Bartimaeus, we would stop and help, but you just aren't as important as this other thing I'm headed to. Sorry, man. Maybe next time. All the while, Jesus says, send, go, preach, baptize, teach in my name, and remember that I ain't leaving you until I come back. We do plenty of going. We go and 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 we go, and there's an opportunity to minister to a hurting and dying world all around us, and we would and we want to, but there's just so much important stuff to get to for that ministry stuff. We don't really have time to slow down and do that. We gotta get to the important stuff. But they call to the blind man, hey, have courage, come on, get up, come on, he's calling you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. So they call him, they encourage him. Isn't it amazing how little real encouragement it takes from one human to another to radically change the person's life? Think about it. They said a few words to this guy. He's calling out, and the crowd's telling him to be quiet. He stays seated, but he's still calling out. But once they give him a tiny bit of encouragement, real true encouragement, this dude hops up and takes off. This dude's blind, in case y'all forgot. He threw off his coat, jumped up, came to Jesus. This, bl this blind begging, nothing in the world having, except for believing in Jesus, man, what does he do? He leaps up, throws off the most valuable thing in his life, his coat or a hemation, an outer garment, so he doesn't trip, so he isn't slowed down, and because he has reckless abandon to get to the feet of Jesus. I'll worry about my coat later. I gotta get to the feet of Jesus. I'll worry about my worldly security later. I gotta get to the feet of Jesus with reckless abandonment. That's what real expectant faith does and how it shows up. It has reckless abandon, abandonment. It's not measured, it's not logical, it's not prim and proper. It's Katie bar the door, here I come Jesus. Forget the rest of it, here I come. Bartimaeus, is getting to the feet of Jesus as fast as he can because he knows, he believes deep down in his very soul if he can just meet Jesus, Jesus can change it all. He had more sight than all these seeing folks around him. He had spiritual sight. He saw that if he could get to Jesus, that's all he needed. And then Jesus, as only Jesus does, asks him a question. What do you want me to do? <laughs> hey there, buddy. You're blind. You're begging. You have nothing. And I mean nothing. Hey there, uh, Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> it's like, well, thought it was fairly obvious there, Jesus, Captain Obvious. Why, why doesn't Jesus just do it? Why, why does Jesus always ask in these situations? Is he, is he trying to degrade the man? Of course not. There's power in words. That's why. There's power in words. There's power in confessing our needs with each other and especially to Jesus. Confession is faith. It's hope and trust in action. That's what faith is. He says, what do you want me to do for you? What if Jesus asked you that directly to your face, face to face? Would you have an answer? Or would you have to think about it? 
Are, are you so busy you'd actually have to think about what you want from Jesus if he stood right in front of you and said, what do you want me to do for you? I have a question for you today. If you know what you need and want from Jesus, why aren't you confessing it to him? Right here today. We just had a prayer time. We just had a prayer time. Why didn't you leap to your feet and throw off your coat and spend time at the feet of Jesus with fellow believers encouraging you? Have courage. Get up. He's calling you. What was it that was stopping you? Well, I don't want people wondering what's wrong. Eh, I don't want to make a spectacle. I don't want to make a scene. Eh, I don't want to be dramatic or come off as dramatic. I mean, it's not really that big of a deal. Other people have so much more going on. What I'm going through is not as big a deal as that. Well, what if, what if I get emotional? What if I lose control of myself in front of others? Well, maybe, church, just maybe. That's the kind of humble faith abandonment that Jesus is waiting for, for you to display so he can get the credit he deserves for the miracle he's about to perform for you and your family and your needs. So there's no way you can say any other thing other than, I don't know, man. Jesus did it. Maybe that's what he's waiting on, for you to just forget it. Just forget all the man-made stuff that's keeping you from just giving yourself over to him and whatever it is that you're going through. Maybe he's waiting for that so that he can get the credit and only he can get the credit because only he deserves the credit. What do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus had an answer. Rabbi and I, the blind man told him, I want to see. I want to see. Rabbi and I, teacher or master, a title of deep respect. My Lord, my master. He's expressing his proper humble heart position. How do you approach Jesus? He's no longer using the national messianic title, son of David. He's now using a personal faith in Jesus title. Rabbi and I. I want to see. And Jesus says, go your way. Jesus told him, your faith has healed you. And immediately, he could see and began to follow him on the road. You know what happens when you place real faith in Jesus? Real, reckless, abandon, forget the world, forget it all. I'm trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone. For my needs. You know what happens? You're radically changed. And all you want to do is follow him. All you want to do is walk beside him. That's all you want to do. And that's all he wanted to do. So I got a question. I got two questions. This is the second to the last one. Are you interruptible in your life? This sermon's been on my heart for some months now. And we were talking about it in the office one day. I hope Jess doesn't mind me sharing this because I'm not bagging on her because I could tell the same story about myself. But we were talking about this concept of being interruptible. And she said, I feel like the thing I say the most is to my kids, because moms struggle with momming in case you didn't know. It's kind of a hard job. In a minute. She said, I feel like that's the thing I say to my, my kids the most. In a minute. Why? Because you got stuff to do. And it's important stuff, right? But sometimes, sometimes the things we're saying in a minute to are the things we should be spending the most time on. And the things that we think are important are the least important things we ever do. Are you interruptible? Or are you only focused on the important things you got to do at the expense of the people around you that you could be ministering to in your life? Are you interruptible? Are you going to allow ministry to take place outside of what you have planned? 
and what you think it should look like in our neat, tidy, little comfortable faith boxes. Anything outside of that, Jesus? Find somebody else. In here, I'll do this because I'm comfortable. Guess what? You're apt to not give Jesus credit for that stuff. But this stuff out here that takes Jesus to do it, that's where the real ministry happens. So that's one question. The last one is a statement. Jesus stopped for you. Jesus stopped for you. We'll spend some time on that in the next couple of weeks. On the cross, after resurrection, he stopped for you. Many of you know that. Many of you have come to saving faith in Christ because you realize Jesus stopped for you. My question this morning is, is there anybody here that didn't realize that, that's never said, oh, he stopped for me too. I'm allowed to put faith in Jesus. I'm allowed to be saved by Jesus. I thought I had sinned too much. I thought I had been too far from, I thought I'm too far from God. I didn't realize that Jesus cares about me too. Jesus cared about Bartimaeus, the blind begging nobody, that hundreds of people were walking by and dismissing. Jesus stopped for him. He stopped for me. He stopped for you. <laughs> Would you jump up, throw off your coat and run to him? And accept him as the savior, king, healer, wonderful God that he is this morning? Maybe you've already done that. Maybe you don't need salvation this morning. Maybe you just, you just needed to be reminded that Jesus stopped for you. And you needed to spend some time with him during these last couple of minutes or however long. I don't know, but I would be willing to bet that every single person in here, the Holy Spirit is trying to talk to you about something. Are you interruptible? Father God, I thank you that you love us. I thank you for grace. Lord, I pray if salvation needs to take place this morning, if someone needs to talk to one of us down front, uh, Lord, that you would make that happen. And I pray for uh, healing and restoration in your name. During this time, I pray for encouragement uh, and empowerment through the Holy Spirit during this time. I pray that your will would be done, the will in heaven, God, that it would be done on earth during this time as we gather together in your name today, God. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.